Hare Krishna. So the question is, is spiritual tourism to India dangerous for one's mental health and emotional balance? Now, for many of us, this question itself may seem strange, if not outrageous or scandalous. So the context is recently an article was published in The Guardian, which was an extract from a book called Lost Forever in the Valley of Lost in the Valley of Death. And the article itself was titled Lost Forever in India. Travelers who were lost forever. Why tourists experience India syndrome? And this book purports to describe many travelers who came to India and they went to some spiritual places, some holy places, and they became very mentally disturbed. They faced some psychological breakdowns and they had to be treated. They have the interview of a psychiatrist also who has treated several people like this. And the solution is, the psychiatrist says, is, in many cases, is just the plane ticket back home from India. So. This article has raised a few concerns among people. Let's try to look at uh, them one by one. First of all, let's consider the concerns. Hey, if somebody has been disturbed, then that's definitely a matter of concern. If we consider the broad Indian culture, it is Atiti Devo Bhava, that we welcome visitors, welcome guests, and we would like to care for them as well as possible. And if they are getting disturbed, then that is definitely a matter of concern. And if there's something which is causing it and which is solvable for us, definitely we would like to fix it. Now, before we actually deal with the problem, we need to understand how prevalent is it. So the book says that there are dozens of tourists who experience like this. Now, dozens might seem a large number. If one, some, but he reads that book, they may feel it's like, oh, so many people have these problems like this. But if we consider the number of tourists in India, it was 5 million roundabouts in 2010. And now it is uh, 17 million before the pandemic started, of course, 2019. So it's increased three times. And if we consider from that perspective, is it a, a very significant number? Every number is a matter of every single individual is a matter of concern at one level. But to call it an India syndrome, that is taking a very minor phenomena and negatively labeling an entire country. Many Indians who go to America or for that matter Chinese or even anybody from the third world who goes to America and settles over there, quite often they experience, uh, soon start experiencing stress, loneliness, depression. So should we call this as the America syndrome? And they say that this is not just a matter of culture shock. Culture shock wears out over a period of time. But people who relatively stay longer or who come for a spiritual purpose, uh, they get disturbed. Their sense of reality gets uh, disturbed. So, well... Would, would they accept if we call America syndrome like that? No. So it's a very, very small phenomenon. There are hardly, there are practically no statistics at all, no broader perspective to consider that in how many, in a population of how many people who are visiting India, how many are experiencing this? Now, another point is we can consider the cause. Now, the author itself acknowledges that is it that people are disturbed and when they come to India, then their own disturbance is being played out here? Or is it something within India that is causing that disturbance? So now it's both could be possible. At one level, the author says there's something about the atmosphere of India. It seems to bring out the subconscious and then it makes people confront those buried things deep within them. And that can be very destabilizing. 
So, okay, that could be. Now, if it is within their subconscious and it is coming out, first of all, what is the cause of it? Is it the is it the stimuli that are provided by India? There are many people who have positive spiritual experiences also. People come to India not just to visit the Taj Mahal or to do some cheap medical treatment as compared to the third world. If they're coming especially for spiritual purposes, then it is not because of the mainstream media. It is often in spite of the mainstream media. That means the mainstream media doesn't always portray India positively. In fact, in papers like Guardian or others, even BBC, there's hardly one positive article about India. So, and similarly, if we consider um, Hollywood, in general, the Western media, it is not particularly charitable in depicting India. So where does the spiritual aspect of India come from? Where are people's impressions about India formed from, come formed from? That's one question. And another question is, quite often people who explore spirituality, it is possible that they are disturbed seriously. And when they are seriously disturbed and they seek some spiritual solace, yes, spirituality can offer solace. It can offer emotional strength. But there are times when a person may be heavily disturbed themselves and they may need medical attention. So it could be that these people are already disturbed and then they come and it is not necessarily India. It could be anywhere that could happen. Uh, some, some stimuli can set people off. Just like we have post-traumatic stress disorder. Now certain stimuli set people off. Would America call, anybody in America call PTSD as the Afghanistan syndrome or the Iran, Iran-Iraq syndrome? Well, they wouldn't malign countries like that. Although people have been killed over there and people have, those who are suffering from the syndrome have seen experiences of human brutality. But even then, a pejorative label like this is not assigned to an entire country. And of course, it is sadly true that like in any other human activity, there can be people who mislead. So there could be people who are themselves misled about what they are misinformed, they misconceive what spirituality is and what to expect from India. And when they come to India, they may be misled because there are, of course, people who want to make a, a quick buck out of uh, people's uh, spiritual or uh, other such uh, aspirations and sentiments. So a certain level of discernment is also required. But just as there are so many people who are with ulterior motives in every area of life. If you just consider science, even consider publishing of, publication of academic papers. There are so many scandals over there, so much data is doctored. But, say, if in psychology, uh, in a data is doctored, we call it this, this is a psychology syndrome. But rarely we use names like this. The generalization, a blanket generalization like this, suggests that there may be an ulterior motive over there. Also, it's just no attempt to give any alternative explanation. The only one Indian doctor who it is said has built a career in treating, partly in treating people like this. Only that person's opinion is taken. Well, as Einstein said, science is a wonderful thing if one doesn't have to earn a living out. So why not take experiences of people who have come to India and have had uplifting experiences? Many, many seekers and thinkers have come and they have actually not only had delightful experiences which did not disturb their mental sense of balance, rather it gave them fresh perspectives and those fresh perspectives help them to function better in life, function better in future. And when you're the most successful people in Silicon Valley, they often had transformative experiences in India. So that also is something which should be considered. Why not consider Steve Jobs came to India, Mark Zuckerberg, Larry Page, even Julia Roberts, or it in love. That talks about her experiences in India. So they didn't get disturbed. 
at least for perspective, give the examples of these people. No, that's not done at all. So that is a very unfortunate. And that's why that brings us to the last part. What can we do? It is important for us to take the responsibility for presenting and representing India properly. India has a glorious spiritual legacy which can enrich humanity. And if we don't take the responsibility of telling the story of spirituality, well, somebody else is going to. And currently, it, it seems to be a hangover of the colonial mentality. Although colonialism is often condemned, but in some ways, it is the best telling, okay, what Indian spirituality is and what it will do to you. So it is for us, we may, have shaken, we may have shackled off the political rule of the of UK, but they still rule intellectually in many ways by shaping our worldview. And if not our worldview directly, shaping the world's view of us. And that's why now with social media available, uh, to some extent, outreach has been democratized. Many of the mainstream newspapers are sometimes called as the legacy media because they may soon become uninfluential significantly because thoughtful people can see the biases in various uh, media and they would much rather, rather learn from other sources. So we need more and more podcasters, we need more and more uh, channels which present the traditional understanding or at least an understanding that is sympathetic to the lived experience of people who are sympathetic to the tradition, sympathetic to Indian wisdom, Indian spirituality, Indian culture. And it is, it is no one else is going to do it. It is for us to take that responsibility ourselves. For each one of us, in whatever way we can, we share our spiritual experiences. And in this way, we can actually make a positive difference.